Hello, uh, this is Christian, and today we are going to finish up our discussion of One Sentence Poems by Walt Whitman by looking at By the Bivouac's Fitful Flame. As a quick reminder of where we've come, we started by looking at When I Heard the Learned Astronomer, and there we thought about the idea that over the course of the poem, we have a shift in the idea that learning is better done through experiencing the stars than hearing somebody lecture about the mathematics behind astronomy. We then turned to our second poem, which was A Glimpse. And there we looked at how um, you can use commas to create an intimacy in a poem. And now we're going to look at By the Bivouac's Fitful Flame. By the bivouac's fitful flame, a procession winding around me, solemn and sweet and slow. But first I note the tents of the sleeping army, the fields and woods dim outline, the darkness lit by spots of kindled fire, the silence, like a phantom far or near, an occasional figure moving, the shrubs and trees. As I lift my eyes, they seem to be stealthily watching me. I wind in procession thoughts, oh tender and wondrous thoughts of life and death, of home and the past and loved, and of those that are far away. A solemn and slow procession there as I sit on the ground by the bivouac's fitful flame. So again, this is one of these poems that we've been looking at that are one sentence long. And so we have a, a complete thought in a single syntactic unit. So we're gonna go through line by line as we are accustomed to doing. By the bivouac's fitful flame. A bivouac is a campfire, so already we have a setting from the start. We have a double alliteration here in the first line, because we have by and bivouac, and then we have fitful flame. And that F alliteration, fricative alliteration, draws attention to the poetics immediately, right? We've been talking about how alliteration creates units and uh, um, draws attention to the way in which a poem is self-consciously constructed. And you do that through the idea of diction. A bivouac specifically is a temporary camp. So this is the location by the bivouac's fitful flame. And then we shift. A procession winding around me, solemn and sweet and slow, dash. But first I note. So here again, we have some alliteration, really solid alliteration um, that picks up a little bit on the session part of procession. The thing I want to draw attention to though is this new piece of punctuation here, which is a dash. And what dashes do is they interrupt. Dashes interrupt. And what happens here is the speaker starts telling us about the processions winding around him, solemn and sweet and slow. We don't hear what that procession is because dash, interruption, first I note. To note is to make an observation um, and you know, you can, um, something is noted. And what this person notes is what's going on around him, the physical part of what's going on around. So the procession seems to be winding and we don't know if it's a physical or an intellectual or an imaginary procession, but now we have the physical parts of this camp. And we learn it's the tense of the sleeping army. And sleeping army is going to be important because it sets up this idea that we've been looking at, which is the one versus the many, right? So you have the plurality of the army versus the single person that's telling us this um, poem, the speaker. Uh, we also have the idea that the speaker is awake because the speaker is noting things versus the sleeping nature. So in the same way, in a glimpse, we had the multitude of the crowd making noise, drinking an oath and smutty jest with the army there um, sleeping. And then in a glimpse, we have the couple that was set off to the side being silent. And in this poem, we have the army being silent. So again, these same themes, right? We also saw it in the learned astronomer, the crowd applauding for the astronomer versus the quiet, almost sick nature of the single person who needed to escape speaker also notices the fields and woods dim outline. Dim because of the time of day, right? Is it about to be dawn uh, or is the fire casting this light on it? Either way, we have um, the distance is in shadows, 
and that is made explicit in the next line, the darkness lit by spots of kindled fire. The plural here, spots, is important because it tells us there's many little fires that are out there, right? So it's, it's, um, we start with the bivouac's little flame, and that's the speaker's bivouacking flame. But we also have other people with other fires, and they're kindled. Right? So that's this idea of human interaction with that element. But there's also silence. So people aren't hanging around these fires making noise, right? Because they're sleeping. They're sleeping. In the next line, the speaker convolutes the syntax. So it says, like a phantom, far or near, an occasional figure moving. And the way you need to rewrite that is an occasional figure moving like a phantom. The occasional figure moving like a phantom. And it appears like a phantom, right? Because it's like ghost-like. So whether these figures are starting to wake up or are getting up to go to the bathroom or whatever, they are ghost-like. And this is a simile, a simile. And we keep noting. So each of these are observations that the person notes. Um, the next thing, though, is the shrub and trees. As I lift my eyes, they seem to be stealthily watching me. Another new form of punctuation for us here is the parenthesis, the parenthesis. And what it does here is it almost mimics the secret nature of this watching, the stealth. And so it hides inside of it, right? It creates this little... Um, kind of a den or a hidey hole for the, the watching that happens. So the, the, the punctuation acts to hide this thought. Um, and as I lift my eyes, they seem to be watching. They is the shrubs and trees. They is the shrubs and trees. At this point, in the next line, uh, the speaker picks up their thought from earlier because notice we have, and. I think I'm going to change my color to draw attention to this. Wind, back to wind, and procession, back to procession. But this time, we finish the thought because it's the thoughts that are coming back to the speaker, right? So earlier on, the speaker cut off from what it was that was going around him, and now we learn, oh, it's his, his thoughts, he's reminiscing. And they're fond thoughts, right? Oh, tender and wondrous thoughts. And we get another list. So just like we noted things earlier, now we're gonna get a list of the thoughts. So we have life and death, and that makes sense, right? The person is in the army, they're thinking about mortality and the danger that's there, and of home. And so when you're far away from home, you feel homesick. The past, whatever used to happen versus the now of the fitful flame, and then loved. So loved is interesting because it seems it could be loved ones, right? Uh, the loved ones of this person, or loved could be an adjective that we apply to home and to the past, right? Like um, loved, he, like he loved his past, he loved his home in the past. So he, it works in a number of ways. And then those that are far away, right? This idea that the speaker is only in a temporary situation with this army that's on the move. And they're in contrast to the people that the speaker knew before joining the army. We then get a uh, continuation again of earlier lines. And so I'm going to pull up yet another color for this one because we have solemn, which we saw before, and slow, which we saw before. Something is left out though, and that is sweet. So a fundamental question of interpretation for this poem is, why isn't there sweet? So you'll remember we talked a little bit about uh, the difference between facts of a poem, like what happens. Nobody can argue that there's a bivouac flame. But what we can argue about and interpret and use as evidence is why there's no sweet, right? We make this observation, there is no sweet. But then we can have a discussion of what does that mean? as he sits on the ground. Um, and so there's a number of ways that you can take that. Um, an easy one, perhaps, is that these thoughts have gotten into the speaker's brain and now they're questioning um, if they are so tender and wondrous. Maybe there's now like, a sadness or even a kind of depression that's arisen. And in the very last line, we have 
a return to the first line, right? A repetition. And one of the things that is really great about this poem is the verb winding, because to wind means to go around in a circle. And so the poem itself winds back on itself. All right, these three poems work really, really well together. And I hope that by studying them slowly and taking time unpacking them, it's helped raise your appreciation for the like, rudimentary tools of studying poetry.